For the Germans, the First World War in the West was predominantly a defensive war. And with the, with the exception of the Battle of Verdun, it was the defensive battles that shaped the memory of this war. And Bob has already talked about uh, the Battle of Verdun, so I don't really have to do it. Um, it's just an interesting one. It doesn't really belong to this conference here, but uh, as a general point, when you look at commemoration, uh, when you go to the continent and you look at the French and the Germans, for them the outstanding battle really is the Battle of Verdun. Uh, when you ask a Brit what's the most famous battle, of course, you always get the Somme. Ask a Frenchman, ask a German, it will always be Verdun, which really sums up for these two nations uh, the, uh, the memory of the war, which is also why uh, Cole and Mitterrand, why this famous picture where they stand shaking hands, holding hands, was taken at Verdun and nowhere else. The question of how to conduct a defensive battle was not new in 1914, and even before the conflict, multi-thinkers in Germany had occupied themselves with this question to some regard. Helmut von Molke, we've heard his name quite a few times before, uh, this time the elder, the chief of the Prussian German Royal Staff from 1857 to 1888, recognized that the introduction of new weaponry had changed the rules of the game. As early as 1862, and thus before the German Wars of Unification, Molke stated that modern weapons had a devastating effect, which gave the defender the upper hand and which the attacking infantry could not easily overcome. And earlier, so Michael Howard talked about uh, uh, Molke's uh, speech in the Reichstag about the new Thirty Years' War, which links in with this development. However, the problem for Germany was that this realization could not solve the big problem. For Germany, for German military thinkers, the main concern lay on the strategic level of war and the operations necessary in order to defeat potential future enemies. Germany's uh, geopolitical position in the center of Europe and the fact that it was surrounded by enemies or potential enemies dictated their thought. Only a quick, as we've heard quite a few times, only a quick decisive victory on the strategic level would enable Germany to survive in this political situation. For the Germans, the key to success lay in the numbers of units in the field at the beginning of the war. And again, that links in with the question of mobilization that we've heard quite a bit about uh, before. And that was more important than tactical superiority in the field itself. One of Molke's successors as chief of the general staff, uh, Count von Schlieffen, we've mentioned his name quite a few times, believed that the sheer masses of modern armies made success of smaller units on the battlefield less decisive than success in what he called the Gesamtschlacht, the culminating battle. And I'm going to throw in a few German words because, let's face it, that sounds very sexy, doesn't it? So it's very important to have German words. It's, it's, it always works. Um, the large numbers of soldiers available to the conscript army meant that tactical and operational attacks could and should still be carried out. The influ influential writer Freier von der Golz acknowledged that the attacks would result in heavy casualties. But he argued that it was easy to forget that, and I quote, casualties are a prerequisite of victory on the battlefield. He who ponders too much to avoid losses forgets how to bear those that are necessary, end of quote, which is quite an interesting one. Of course, when we see it in the context of the First World War, we know what's happening afterwards. So you might say, hmm, is that really true? But maybe that's something, uh, well, to, to think about, think about a bit more deeply, also for political masters today. If you go to war, people die, simple as that. If you're not willing to accept that fact, you shouldn't go to war in the first place. Moreover, there seemed to be a solution for the tactical problems, and that was morale. Again, uh, we touched on, on that a little bit uh, earlier. It was widely argued that morale was the crucial factor on the battlefield, and morale was obviously on the attacker's side, and now is another interesting uh, little, uh, argument here. While moving forward, the soldiers would not notice the suffering of their wounded or killed comrades falling behind and the numbers of casualties sustained. That was a common argument brought forward uh, by, by many, many writers, not only in Germany. The defenders, on the other hand, would drown in their own blood, as, they, as people wrote, since the troops were forced to remain put and fight a, uh, a static defensive uh, engagement. These images were supposed to have a lasting effect on the defending troops and their morale. The increasing defense of powers armies did thus not, did thus not mean an end of the argument about morale supremacy. On the contrary, it led to the paradox that this was used as the foundation for offensive tactics on the battlefield. Owing to the fact that modern weaponry clearly favored the defender, morale was widely regarded as the only factor that could be used in the attacker's favor. The outcome was unequivocal. The German infantry manual of 1906 stated, and I quote, the infantry has to care for its impulse to attack. Its actions have to be determined by the only thought, attack the enemy, whatever the cost. Mind would prevail over matter. Morale would triumph over machine guns and artillery. Even though there were doubts in the German military elite about the possibility of a short war, we've talked about that. Um, some people actually thought, uh, again, this 30 years war uh, example, that uh, it might not actually happen, even though everyone was hoping it would happen, was planning for it. 
The underlying ideas of this concept included prevailed. Strategic and operational matters triumphed over tactics. The German armies could no longer afford the luxury, as Schlieffen had called it, of prolonged defensive battles. And it was imperative that the soldiers' drill and training convinced them of the offensive's superiority. The, re the result of this approach was seen in the opening stages of the First World War, which were, as we've discussed earlier, the bloodiest months of the entire conflict. Very quickly, it became apparent that morale was not a good shield against machine gun bullets and that the impulse for attack might not deliver the result it was meant to deliver. As a consequence, as we all know, the initial German offensive in the West failed and the race to the sea resulted in a stalemate in the Ypres salient. Therefore, Erich von Falkenhayn, Bob's mentioned him already, so I don't have to say who he is, ordered the army in the West to form defensive positions on the 25th of November 1914. He knew that this was the end of German hopes of a quick victory. But he had to accept it, as, as he wrote in his, uh, in his uh, autobiography, purely and simply as being the lesser evil. Accordingly, trench warfare became, as Hugh Strawn has put it, a matter of expedience, not a foundation for strategy. The interesting thing is that despite his orders, Falkenhayn was not the driving force behind the tactical changes that now occurred. In a study for the Weltkrieg series of the Reichsarchiv, the official history of the year of the war, uh, a member of the research team, Wilhelm Solger, pointed out that the OHL had been only part responsible for the adoption uh, of trench warfare. The real changes, Zorga argued, took place under the guidance of the units that faced the enemy, especially in the West, where the armies faced much higher pressure from the enemy. Accordingly, the changes from the war of movement to trench warfare were a bottom-up development and took different forms. Zolga stated that, for instance, 7th Reserve Corps was almost not affected by the new orders since it had hardly participated in, as he called it, the war of movement uh, in the real sense of the word. Nevertheless, Falkenhayn's orders clarified the situation for the soldiers on the ground. Until then, they had been unsure about the further conduct of operations. This had had some impact on the tactical situation of the troops. The regimental history of 13 infantry regiment from Münster, for example, complained about the defensive positions which the regiment occupied in early December 1914 in the Neuf Chapelle area. These positions had remained unchanged since late October. They were unfavorable for the troops and had, as the regimental history says, not been chosen in accordance with the rule, rules of the art of war. Since it had been believed, believed that these positions would only have to be held for a very short period before the next offensive. In compliance with the 1906 infantry manual, Falkenhayn ordered that only one defensive position with little depth had to be erected. Concentrating the bulk of the troops in only one trench would ensure that the defenders' maximum firepower could be brought to bear. Additional strongholds in the rear were acceptable, but the manual made very, very clear that forward defense positions were regarded as useless. Not only would they hamper the firefight from the main line of resistance, but by losing these positions to the enemy, one's own troops would suffer partial defeats, as Falkenhayn said, and that would weaken the defender's strength and would have a negative effect on morale. Even in the defense of battle, morale was still seen as a battle winner. The experiences of the year 1915, when the Germans had to defend themselves against the Entente offensives, showed that modifications to that system were necessary. Especially the autumn battle in the, uh, autumn battle in the Champagne, in which the French came close to breaking through the German defenses, had a considerable impact. Again, the need for change was at first realized by the troops in the trenches. From late 1914 onwards, the units issued pamphlets which were based on the experiences acquired on the Western Front, and the OHL published selections of these in June 1915. In October of the same year, the OHL issued the, another good German word, Gesichtspunkte für den Stellungskrieg, whoever can translate that, well, you can get a brownie point, uh, aspects of positional warfare. Here, Falkenhayn stated that defensive systems had to be expanded. A second line of resistance had to be erected behind the first one, each of which had to be defendable independently. The second line of resistance should be erected so far to the rear that the enemy would not be able to hit it with concentrated artillery fire, and then an attack on the second line of defense would demand a new deployment of the enemy's infantry and artillery. Despite the growing depth of the defensive position, the first line of resistance was still regarded as the main line of defense, Obkampflinie, or HKL, which had to be held against the enemy. It was here that the enemy's attack should be repulsed. In order to achieve this, Falkenhayn still demanded that the line of the resistance be strongly manned in order to achieve the highest concentration of firepower possible. And now we go into 1916. 1916, 
saw a further development in the conduct of the defensive battle. The Battle of Verdun, again, which caused about, uh, over 300,000 casualties, and the Battle on the Somme, uh, about 500,000 casualties. Even though neither of these two battles have been designed to bleed the enemy white, uh, the casualties taken by the German army caused concern. This was a blood loss that Germany could not afford, and solutions had to be found to this problem. As a result of all these events, as Bob has already mentioned, uh, Falkenhayn is sacked, and in come uh, Paul von Hittenburg and Erich Ludendorff. And Ludendorff stated in his memoirs, and I, and I quote, the loss of ground up to date appeared to me of little importance in itself. We could stand that. But the question of how this and the progressive falling off of our fighting power, of which it was symptomatic, was to be prevented. That was of immense importance. It was just as necessary to have a clear idea of our fighting cap uh, capacity as to know whether our tactical views were still sound. The first was an easy matter, the second of extreme difficulty. Obviously, not everybody agreed with Ludendorff's view on the loss of ground. For example, General von Belo, commander of 1st Army on the Somme, summed up his own experience of the fighting by stating that, and I quote, the fighting must take place in the first line. During the Battle of the Somme, every man was obliged to fight at that point at which he was stationed. The enemy's line of advance could only lead over his dead body. Army headquarters believes that it was owing to, his, to the firm determination to fight with which every leader was inspired that the enemy, in spite of superior numbers, bled to death in front of, our, of the ranks of our soldiers. Uh, there we have it. Nevertheless, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, whose experience of the Eastern Front, as Bob has explained, had been characterized by a much more mobile type of warfare than the West, prevailed. To adapt battle tactics to these realities of warfare, OA, uh, OHL issued the German word, Grundsätze für die Führung der in der Abwehrschlacht im Stellungskriege. It doesn't get more German than that, does it? Well, I mean, let, let's face it. It's, uh, this, is, this is better than saying Blitzkrieg 15 times, I think. That's really good. Um, translates as, roughly speaking, principles for the conduct of the defensive battle in position warfare, issued on the 1st of December 1916. The interesting thing is that response for this new regulation was the OHL operation section, a very small group of about a dozen staff officers. Uh, the head was a half colonel, and most people were captains. Um, so quite interesting in itself. Again, one of the main reasons for the success of the new regulation was that the uh, operations section did not invent tactical innovations at the Green Table. It gathered all the ideas from the field army and their suggestions for changes, and they went out to the units to discuss them with them and then examined as much empirical evidence as possible. The manual provided general guidance for the conduct of the defense of battle, and together with subsequent editions and uh, adaptations, it would become the German doctor of defensive warfare for the rest of the war. As Bob has already explained, material gained in importance, and the main principle of the new directive was to exhaust the enemy while Germany's manpower had to be preserved. To achieve that, the directive no longer demanded static resistance and a holding of all ground once taken, but it advocated a flexible defense spoke of an area of main resistance, a deep zone into which the enemy would be dragged and in which he would exhaust himself. Within the zone, dugouts and concrete strongholds rather than trenches served as the corset bones of the defense. Resistance was not to be conducted in a static manner and it was accepted that the, uh, some of the defensive positions would be taken by the enemy in the course of the battle. This was not a major threat and you can see this uh, the big change uh, in, in the approach. As long as the German forces were able to keep the initiative to, uh, to launch counterattacks, which would drive the enemy forces out of these positions again. Throughout the next two years, the Germans re examined their doctrine, revised it, and adapted it to local conditions. And it's probably correct to say that this flexibility was the strength in the German attitudes towards doctrine. <laughs> to the German tacticians, doctrine was a means to an end, not an end in itself. The result of this approach was that the Entente had gained very little ground in 1917 but it suffered very high losses in manner material. The Germans, of course, had suffered too, and some of the developments and changes on the Entente side had caused pretty big problems for the Germans. For instance, the bite and hold tactic used by the British, uh, and also the tank, we have to, uh, to mention the tank, uh, that had a profound impact on well, the tactical battle, and which initially caused the Germans great problems. We only have to think of the Battle of Cambrai. Nevertheless, the Germans had preserved enough strength not only to continue the war into 1918, <laughs> but also to knock Russia out of the war. The German elastic defense in depth on the Western Front had proven its value, and without it, it seems at least doubtful whether, the, whether Germany would have had enough reserves to achieve victory in the East and to launch offensive in the West in 1918. 
Crown Prince Wilhelm was convinced that had the German army not changed its defensive doctrine, he said, in, in, in a quote from his uh, biography, autobiography, the German army would not have come victoriously through the great defensive battles of 1917, end of quote. In 1918, as Bob has already uh, explained, Germany took the last gamble and launched the offensive in the West. When the offensives had failed, the power of resistance began to decrease. On 21st of July 1918, General Major Losberg, an expert on defensive warfare, sent a report to Ludendorff stating that German forces were very weak. In some sectors of the front, the companies were not stronger than 20 or 30 men. Moreover, the artillery had uh, hardly any shells left, so that the infantry could not expect much support from the guns in defensive battle. Major Beck, the later chief of the general staff, a member of the 20th of July plot, summed up the situation when he said that our defensive line is a mere spider's web. The army had suffered heavy casualties. And again, Bob's given some figures earlier. Um, another figure, for example, I could give you is uh, approximately 80,000 uh, casualties alone on the first day of the Michael Offensive. The remaining troops, as Bob has explained, were of uh, lower quality than the spearhead units of the offensives, those that had taken the highest casualties. Also, the fact that these offensives had failed uh, had a deep impact on German morale and the Spanish flu, one thing that we quite often forget when we talk about the final phase of the war, hit the exhausted German soldiers harder than their untorn counterparts. These factors caused immense problems in the defensive battles that now occurred. In early July 1918, Ludendorff had still seemed it, uh, deemed it important to point out to the commanding officers that the defense in depth had to be upheld and that the soldiers should not be deployed in one single trench. However, this perception now changed. Ludendorff issued an order on the 4th of September 1918, pointing out the latest changes in doctrine to the troops. He stated that the main line of resistance had to be held at all costs again, and that counterattacks had to be launched only if they had good prospect of success. In contradiction to the Grundsätze ab der Schlacht, Ludendorff stated that sealing off the occupied territory would normally be the better solution. Despite this very critical situation, Ludendorff tried to see the positive in this development as well. I'm a bit desperate to be perfectly honest, but there we are. Uh, and he argued that standing fast and not surrendering ground would have a devastating effect, well, maybe not, on the enemy and his morale, since he had got used to making some ground, as he said, before encountering strong resistance. Now the army was again faced at the main line of resistance rather than by units deployed in depth. The new tactical guidelines were reintroduced by a number of uh, orders issued by the OHL in the following weeks. The character and the intention of these are clear. It was of paramount importance to preserve one's own fighting power on the physical and psychological levels. Economy of force and morale of the troops became the centers of gravity around which fighting on the tactical level had to revolve. All these points and latest developments were clear indicators of the decreasing fighting power and morale of the German army. It is fair to say, and I really don't want to say it, but it is true, by November 1918, Germany was truly beaten. Um, even though this had not been their aim, the Allies won the war by wearing the enemy down, by bleeding him white, to use the alleged words of Falkenhayn in the Battle of Verdun. The answer to the German collapse of, in 1918 seemed, looking at, like, at this, uh, relatively clear, lack of manpower, as Bob has explained, lack of material, lack of morale, lack of supplies. Perhaps the question should not be why Germany surrendered in 1918, but the question might be how the German army in the West managed to fight and for so long. Perhaps, open for discussion, uh, the main answer to this is the intellectual and doctrinal flexibility, which was on the whole, oh God, now I can, I can hear people howling, uh, I would say was greater than that of the enemies. However, and that's an important lesson to, uh, to, uh, to remember, and we've talked about it this morning, this relative superiority on the field of battle was not enough to win the war. And it wasn't enough to win the war in 1918, and of course it wasn't enough to win the war in 1945 either. So German tactical and operational superiority was not matched by well, strategic thinking or good policies, and that, of course, you might say, was the doom of the Germans in the second, First and Second World Wars. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.